Bryce is the phone. Okay. Tonight's aims. Facts. To see how God detailed for Israel the desirability and the necessity of righteous living. Principle. To show that although we are not to keep the ceremonial law, we are nevertheless called to righteous living. Application. To live a consistent Christian life daily to honor the Lord and not incur his discipline. Sounds good. Sounds good. Who, uh, anyone else? Pretty much covers everything, I think. I think the I think the key for me was the principle. Okay. Uh, although we're not to keep the ceremonial law, there are things within the law that are good for us to follow. Right, right, and and of course, uh, uh, I would hope that everybody understands what why the writer singles out the ceremonial law. Uh, I'm not sure why they didn't single out the judicial law as well, but uh, yeah, because we most certainly know that we don't have to, we do not observe the judicial, the judicial law of the uh, of the Mosaic law. You know, we we understand that there's three three sections of it: judicial, uh, moral, and of course uh, the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law and the and the uh, the uh, judicial laws were fulfilled on the cross. So again, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we as teachers understand that so that if the question comes up from our students, we will be able to explain uh, that particular situation. Of course, we understand now that the that the moral law mainly consists of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and that is why Brother Ron said what he said is that we must, most certainly we are required to follow the moral law. And of course, uh, we understand that the judicial law are those laws uh, that were given by God uh, in order to be able to deal with uh, with those uh, violations of the law uh, as related to, again, I remember now, it was this only applied to the nation of Israel. Uh, these ceremonial uh, and judicial uh, laws were designed to, uh, to govern uh, the nation of Israel because, again, remember they were a theocracy which meant that God was their king, and of course they were his servants, and therefore the uh, because they were a theocracy, they were governed by the laws of God, uh, not just after not just after they, after they became uh, a monarchy, but more but more or less uh, more strictly uh, prior to that particular point in time, they were governed by uh, the laws of uh, uh, the ceremonial judicial, and of course obviously the uh, moral law, and and that. Uh, and those observations continued throughout their existence. Again, remember Jesus fulfilled uh, both the uh, the ceremonial and the judicial law on the cross. So uh, that's that's that. If there are no further questions, we can go on uh, and look at that picture. Now, you guys not going to let Ryan answer all the questions, are you? No. No, we're not. We're here. <laughs> it, it's <laughs> like not looking to the left or the right, but looking straight ahead. Keep your eye on the cross. All right. There you go. As they say, keep your eye on the prize. Don't let it wander to the left or to the right. All righty. What about that introduction? A lot going on. A lot going on there. A lot going on there. A lot of truth. A lot of truth. I agree with that. Any other comments besides that? The only other comment I had was going back to the drawing. Okay. It took me to Matthew 7, 14. Which? Well... Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Right. Good, a good backdrop scripture. Any other comments? 
Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, now, well, when it came to the introduction, I did like um, absolutely when he said, even though Amos was um, prophesying, I say to the north, he told the south that you all better be listening. That you know they needed to be listening too. And so uh, for me, that word goes to us as well, that even though we're looking at Old Testament and they were talking to them at that time, we need to be listening in today's society as well as this old as this old lesson may have been, but it still applies. Amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, that's what yeah, I was that's what I was gonna say. Okay. Is that it? You had nothing to add to that? Uh, I was gonna say that. <laughs> All righty. Uh, what 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 I would uh, like to just point out here as we go into the lesson is that uh, I, I think that you would agree that uh, all these lessons that we've had thus far uh, are, have been very convicted. However, none of them is as convicting as I think probably Sister Stella was uh, was alluded to this uh, as it relates to the condition of the church today, because you remember now, God is talking to his people. <clears throat> and his people, of course, obviously, uh, Amos not only prophesied to the nation of Judah and Israel, he also yeah. prophesied to those nations around them. Uh, right. But in essence, uh, there are messages in this particular lesson uh, that I don't, that I think that we need to really uh, look at very, very hard because they most certainly are speaking to the church of today. Uh, it speaks to the church of the day as far as how God looks at his people and how we are to worship him and how he does not, uh, uh, as they say in the old country, he don't mess around with foolishness. Uh, either you are for him, either you love him, either you obey and worship him fully, wholly, or, you, you know, or you're not doing it and therefore uh, he is not pleased. Remember now, the only difference between us and Israel, of course, is, is that we are covered by the, the new covenant, which, of course, is, uh, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Whereas in the Old Testament, they were covered, by the, they were covered uh, under the covenant of law. And of course, we understand now that the law could never save you, uh, but most certainly uh, the law could condemn you uh, because uh, that was, that was the, uh, the character of the law. So again, we want to look at those uh, also uh, as we go into the lesson. Now, uh, we do see we have four outlines, a godly lifestyle, 14 and 15, chapter 5 we're in, uh, a fearful time, verses 18 through 20, a rejected worship, a rejected worship, 5, 21 and 24, a deserved recompense. Like that word, recompense, 5, 25, and 27. Okay, so uh, we have those outlines. And before, before I go into uh, the lesson, I do want to just do one thing here. Uh, I think we brought out, I think we already brought out, uh, Sister Brain did in her introduction, uh, I'm sorry, uh, with her uh, aims. And uh, Sister Stella pointed that out in her comments as well. But uh, these lessons, we need to make sure that we understand the, the geography of what's going on here. So what I want to do is I want to, uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, bring up on my screen. The map of the nation and uh, if if you have a better one, Ron, you can you can shoot it to me. But I think that that what we the what we want to do here, I think this map can cover that. OK, here on your on your screen, you see the map of Israel. OK, in other words, what you see here is actually Israel and Judah. Remember now, uh, David long gone, Solomon long gone. Uh, right now, uh, uh, you have a a different. You have actually have two different kings now uh, that's ruling the nation. 
Uh, the nation now has been divided in half. Well, not really in half, but it's been divided uh, it, by uh, uh, by the North and Southern Kingdom. And uh, if you can see my, my map here, the, the Southern Kingdom consists only of these two tribes here. Okay, in other words, it consists of these two tribes uh, referred to as Judah and Benjamin. You have the Northern Ten Tribes, which consists of uh, Reuben, Gad, Reuben here, Gad here, Manasseh, not Manasseh, yeah, Manasseh, uh, Ephraim, Dan, uh, Zebulon, Issachar, uh, Naphtali, and Asher. These comprise the northern ten tribes. So you can see now that that the northern ten tribes were called was actually called Israel, and of course, obviously, the southern tribe was called Judah. So uh, in this particular lesson, we find now Amos, which is which was actually from a little town uh, uh, a little bit um, uh, past Jerusalem uh, is where he's from. Uh, and of course, like I said before, uh, he did prophesy to Judah, but it, was, but it wasn't as extensive as his prophecy to uh, the, the northern ten tribes. Uh, so, so that's where we are right now as it relates to the, as it relates to the geography uh, of, the, uh, of the nation itself. Again, remember now that Jeroboam II uh, is the king of the northern ten tribes. Uh, so we want to keep that in mind. So for the most part, uh, that is the king that that is the king and the people uh, that Amos is talking to. And of course, uh, we also want to know that uh, that it was during the the time of Jeroboam II, not Jeroboam the uh, first, who was actually uh, 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 a servant of of, of Solomon. Who uh, actually took over the, the the who was actually the first king of the, the northern kingdom? Uh, we, we're not talking about here. We're talking about now Jeroboam the second, and of course uh, it was Jeroboam the second now uh, that for the most part restored all this land here that had been lost to the Syrians uh, during the previous uh, king. Jeroboam the second was the fourteenth king of the northern kingdom. So you can see now uh, that at this particular point in time. Uh, the northern kingdom now had become very, very, very prosperous. And of course, uh, they had uh, also gained strength as well. And uh, we will see now, uh, uh, also what I want you to see here is, uh, I want you to notice now these two these two uh, areas here, which is Manasseh. Manasseh uh, was given two portions of land in the northern kingdom. And of course, Ephraim uh, was given this portion down here uh, at the southern end. Remember now that Ephraim, and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph, and uh, Jacob gave uh, those two sons uh, the portion of land uh, as well in the kingdom of, uh, of of Israel, I should say. So you can see now, uh, all I wanted you to do was just to just get in your your, your mind now, as far as uh, as far as uh, the geography of of what we're studying now. Uh, and the last thing I want to uh, I want to bring to to bear is is that when Jeroboam the first one, when he took over the northern ten tribes, what he did was to ensure that the people, in other words, to ensure that the uh, that the separation between the two nations uh, would would uh, would would stand. He he built a uh, a uh, a temple or a shrine, I was, was more like it, uh, in Bethel, so that the people would so that that would prevent the people now from going down to Jerusalem. In order to worship, remember now Jerusalem is the only place where the temple of where, where God's temple was, and it was the only place of worship for God. Again, uh, Jeroboam, uh, in order to uh, in order to thwart that, uh, he built this temple in Bethel uh, in order to, uh, in essence, keep the people uh, in in the northern tribe to keep them up there, and therefore not uh, not allow them to go down to uh, the southern kingdom in order to maintain their worship with God. Remember now. That that the people that that the people connection to God was was the temple. So if you couldn't go worship at the temple, that means that you and Esther uh, had lost that that critical connection now uh, to the God of Israel. So again, those are two things uh, that I wanted to point out because that if because for those of you who have read, which I hope is everyone, uh, if you've read the first uh, fourteen uh, first the first uh, thirteen verses really or or the first part of 
chapter five, uh, you will see the, the 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 term or the name Bethel uh, being mentioned throughout uh, those particular passages of scripture. So again, uh, those are uh, that's just an idea of the the geography of where we're talking about now. Any questions? Okay, here at none. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about Amos. Remember now, whenever we go into a new book, we want to at least have some kind of an introduction uh, in regards to the to the prophet that we're talking about. Or in this case, I should say, not the prophet necessarily, but uh, a a a uh, background of the book. In this case, we're talking about Amos. Anyone? What 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 you want? What you need to know? <laughs> what you need to know? What can you he tell me about Amos? He, he really didn't come from a line of prophets. No, he did not. Uh, actually, he was a shepherd, and I think he grew sycamore trees. Well, sycamore trees, fig trees, what? Uh, fig trees. Um, this is not his area of expertise, and he lived in the southern, but he prophesied in the north. He... um. Uh, he didn't sugarcoat it. He wasn't afraid either. He went straight. He, he gave it to him straight. Um, and at this time, I could be wrong, but I didn't. I'm quite sure they were doing it idolatry. But more than likely, this era they were taking advantage of the poor. Yes. Yeah. They were getting rich off the poor. Okay. I, I thought it was interesting that the way he set up what he had to say is first he talked about judgment against Israel's neighbors. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then saying, okay, you're not exempt either. Right. And then that led into what Willa was just saying. Exactly. And And I think I think it draws, like Stella was saying earlier, I think it draws a direct line to us today because basically what Amos is addressing is Israel's national sins. Right. And we got some national sins. We have many. <laughs> <laughs> we have many. And and, and, and to that point, we, uh, because we do want to get to the lesson uh, to both uh, what Ryan and what uh, Sisters uh, Willa just indicated, uh, uh, and, and this was the reason why I wanted to sort of, uh, uh, sort of highlight, summarize, if you will, uh, the condition at this particular point in time. Jeroboam, as I said before, uh, Jeroboam the uh, second, he had he had literally uh, taken the nation to a point of of prosperity and of great wealth. Mm -hmm. Okay, in other words, uh, you can say you can say that uh, for the most part, uh, he had created an economical. Or an, or an or a uh, any an economic explosion uh, because of the result of his military success. So 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 in essence, uh, at this point, Israel now control uh, all the ancient trade routes. Okay, so you can imagine now with all this wealth and all with all this influence now, uh, this this particular rise uh, gave obviously what would give rise to a new social class of wealthy merchants. In other words. Uh, you got merchants now who have this, uh, who who are uh, who who have these tremendous trade routes uh, going to the north uh, and to the south and what have you, and now uh, they are now becoming uh, tremendously uh, rich. And of course, as you know, uh, and, and I think Ron was alluded to this, is that is that whenever you whenever you have wealth, and, and let's think about America, and that's why I was saying at the beginning of the lesson that this lesson that this particular lesson really really kind of, of, of help us see uh, how God literally sees uh, how wealthy, uh, how, uh, how a person's wealth can actually uh, make them uh, 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 sinful, to say the least, uh, but also to make them despise the poor because uh, at this particular point in time, this wealth created a demand for, for many of the luxuries available from all over the known world. In other words, you got all this money, uh, now you want to uh, now you want to uh, to in essence uh, enhance your influence uh, and enhance your 
uh, uh, your personal uh, image before uh, those who are around you. So therefore now, uh, this pressure by the influx of wealth, uh, jolting social changes took place. In other words, you can imagine now that you have a lot of money coming in. Now you have people uh, wanting to have larger houses and what have you. Uh, in this case, uh, they didn't have cars, obviously. Uh, but if, but uh, uh, in our case, uh, it will be people buying, you know, uh, uh, more more than one cars. And we can and we can see all this, by the way, uh, by looking at uh, how many of the wealth live in America. Uh, many homes in different places, uh, many cars. Although I never could figure out why do you need more than one or two cars, but in either case. Uh, such is the case. Uh, so therefore, you have now a class distinction uh, crystallized. So now you have this distinction between those who are rich and those who are poor. Okay, and of course, uh, as a result, now the rich that they they are, their sole desire is what is to get more money. In other words, uh, the pile of profits at the expense of the poor. Uh, the exorbitant prices were charged. Uh, poor farmers were dis uh, dispossessed uh, so that the rich might build up greater estates. And we see this today in our country. Uh, you know, people, the poor are, be are being pushed aside. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm thinking on my mind now, uh, as I think about Ida, uh, Ida B. Wells in Chicago, south side of Chicago, not that I agree with the projects, by the way, but but the reality is, is, is that that's another way uh, uh, of, again, uh, making uh, a, a an area that was that was actually poor and turn it into an area where now it can be enjoyed by those who are extremely uh, rich. So therefore, you had a heartless, uh, unconcerned for the suffering of the oppressed, uh, marked by those who were well-to-do. And of course, from this, you find out now that the luxury of the, of the luxury of the wealthy class in Israel is clearly indicated by the prophet as he speaks of their couches. I, I think Sister Willow was alluded to this. That speaks of their couches and silken cushions uh, in Amos chapter 3, verses 12, uh, off their winter houses and summer houses and the houses of ivory. Uh, in, in other words, ivory was in low with gold, with go, uh, overload with uh, with gold and what have you. And, and off the houses of hewn stone, Amos 3.15, and also Amos 5.11. And then, of course, uh, as, as, as Sister Willis said, uh, Amos did not, he was not kind. Uh, we would say that he was not politically correct. Because he also talked about the voluptuous women were spoken of as, get this now, as cows of Basham, uh, who insisted that their husband provide ample wine and other luxuries for their feast, even if the poor, all right, even if the poor had to be crushed in order to provide them. And that, of course, is in Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Uh, their feasts were characterized by reverie, songs, music, choice meats. And the best of wines to satiate their lust. Yeah, it seemed by, to me they were high maintenance. Uh, high maintenance, high maintenance, very. And by cushions and silken tasteless tapestries upon which to recline. Again, that's Amos chapter six, verses one through seven. Uh, these luxuries were enjoyed by the wealthy, whose eyes notice this now. Today we see the same thing in America, whose eyes were closed to the afflictions and needs of the poor. That was Amos chapter six. Uh, verse 6. Now, bear in mind now, I'm not saying that it's evil or wrong or sinful to be rich. That's not what the book is saying, and that's not what uh, that's not what Amos, that, that was not Amos' focus as well. His focus was the abuse uh, of wealth, and that's what was going on uh, here. And and, um, and to add to that, of course, was the moral condition of the nation uh, was clearly revealed by the prophet's shock at the cruel treatment of the poor by the rich, at the covetousness injustice and immorality of the people in power and at the general contempt for holy things again that's amos chapter 2 verses uh 6 through 8 trampling on the poor uh taking exaction in other words uh make uh, put in uh taxes and those kind of things uh, on the uh on the uh products that that was being uh worked by farmers amos chapter 5 verse 11 and so forth and i can go on and on and on uh, but but i wanted to give you a picture uh, of the condition uh, of the uh, the state of the nation now. Again, we're talking now uh, not just about the, the northern 10 tribes, but the southern 10 tribes as well. Uh, they so, both were equally guilty, as uh, Ron said, that although Amos prophesied to those nations who were around Israel, Israel by no means were guiltless, and therefore uh, they received uh, condemnation as well. You were going to say, Ron? 
And to add to that list, you just uh, reiterated and drawing a connection between then and now, also in 5-7, in it's, it's a short verse, but he's saying the whole legal and court system was corrupt. Exactly, exactly. You're not only taking advantage of the poor wherever you can, the people aren't getting justice in the court system. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. that sound familiar? It, it, does it? <laughs> I see. I see Stella shaking her head. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, uh, we, we're not saying now that they were bribing a jury because that was not what was happening. What what was happening is, is what we all know happens in our country. If you got money, you could pretty much afford the best of lawyers. Okay, and in my opinion, we probably got too many lawyers. But anyway, uh, you can afford the best lawyers. And of course, they can get you off. If you're poor, however, well, you can't you don't have that luxury. Uh, mm -hmm. You're pretty much stuck uh, with whatever uh, either you can afford or whatever the uh, the state can give you. So, again, uh, against this background of prosperity and oppression, a man who knew poverty, again, he's a sheep herder, OK, appeared from Judah. And for a short few months, he denounced the sins of Israel and promised judgment. Okay, and of course, uh, as Sister Willis said, uh, Amos was a uh, was a was a sheep herder uh, from the town of Tekoa, uh, which was about twelve miles south of Jerusalem. Uh, so, therefore, obviously, he would know about not only about hard work, but he would also know about the oppression that he was undergoing uh, from those uh, who were rich. And of course, we also want to let you know that uh, that this that the, the book of Amos is the only mention we have of this man uh, in the Old Testament. Of course, uh, you do have the books of First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles uh, do not mention Amos, which is kind of interesting because you remember now when you're reading the Old Testament, you you have to sort of like read the the prophets and the and the historical books together. Because the way it works is what the way it works is is that throughout uh, the the history of these of these two nations these two kingdoms God is constantly doing what He's constantly sending prophets in and out of these particular nations in order to warn them uh, against God's judgment uh, uh, mainly due to as Sister Willow indicated earlier mainly due to their idolatry yes they were doing a lot of other things but 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 the main thrust of, of their sin. Uh, was they had turned from God and they had begun to worship idols. And that was really why I wanted to point out the fact that when Jeroboam took over the northern kingdom, the, the northern kingdom, his first thing that he the first thing that he did was to establish a, a, a shrine in the northern kingdom in order to, to, uh, to make sure now that the people did not go to Jerusalem and worship the true God there. Uh, again, uh, you, you know, we could always make excuses by saying, well, you know, it's too far. You know, this way, you know, we could, you know, you don't have to go as far to worship uh, uh, the God of Israel. You can now worship in this shrine. Again, that was just another way of saying that uh, you can now begin to start worshiping uh, idols uh, just as those, just as the people were doing around him. So uh, uh, even Amos himself, again, going back to what Sister Willow was saying and what Ron was saying in Amos, uh, Amos chapter 7, uh, Amos makes a point here that I was no prophet, uh, nor was I a son of a prophet. That's that's like a, a famous, I think that's like a famous saying. But he was he wanted to make that clear. Uh, and of course, he wanted to make sure that, that people understood that he was not a shepherd, per se, in the sense of being a shepherd of the people, that he was, in essence, a sheep breeder uh, and a tender of sycamore fruit. And, and then, of course, he, he makes a point there. Uh, then the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people. So again, you can see now that the Lord is not looking for people uh, who are who are necessarily uh, uh, upbeat, so to speak, not necessarily popular, uh, not necessarily from uh, well-to-do families and those and those kinds of things. Uh, God normally picks those people who are the least among the least. And his humility was such that, if I'm not mistaken, he's the only prophet that told us his occupation before he talked about his commission. Which, which I think you're, you're, I think you're probably right. I, I, I can't, I'm, I'm not absolutely positive, but that sounds about right because uh, most of the other prophets, we pretty much 
uh, knew who they were. We knew who Isaiah were. We knew that uh, we knew that uh, Elijah was a was a was a prophet as well. Uh, but Amos does go into great detail as far as uh, who he was. And then, well, course, more accurately, he went into great detail as to who he was not. The, and and that's even better because that was really, in other words, it was not so much about who he was, uh, but uh, from my standpoint, I think that it that it was his his passion for God, and of course, uh, the disgust uh, and the shock that he that he witnessed uh, as the people were being uh, abused and taken advantage of by those uh, who had uh, who who were wealthy. And again, what what I also see here in Amos is that. Uh, there are many times that we see things that are wrong and uh, we we are reluctant to to point those things out. Uh, that was not Amos. Amos did not did not uh, back up. He, he 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 called a spade a spade and he called evil evil. And he really did not care uh, what the people thought, because, again, uh, he had been sent by God uh, to, for the most part, uh, uh, warn the people. Uh, about their uh, about their sin, and of course, we already know now that the prosperous, that the uh, the prosperity of Israel, were, they were in essence unmoved, uh, you know, because of because they felt that they were in essence untouched. And, and also, the danger here, and, and we're going to go into the lesson now. But the danger here, of course, also is is that, uh, and I want to keep uh, reemphasizing this so that no one misunderstands what I'm saying is that it is not wrong to be rich. It's, that's not the point. The point is, is, is what do you do with your wealth and how do you see yourself and God? In other words, how do you see your relationship between yourself and God now that you have, uh, now that you have achieved or now that you have uh, come upon this, the, the, the richness that you now have? Unfortunately, uh, most of the time, uh, wealth tends to, uh, to change a, change a person uh, in a in a negative way. Not everybody, but sometimes it, it tends to do that uh, when wealth comes that way. And that's perhaps one of the reasons uh, why God sort of protects us uh, from, uh, from, uh, from riches. And John, to add to what you just said, I think first and foremost here is how did you obtain your wealth? Exactly right. I how did you obtain it? What do you do with it? What's your relationship with the Lord? Exactly right. And 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 that's a and that I, I hope that we keep that key and that key point in our minds as we go into our lesson. Okay, let's let's jump in. Uh, first outline fourteen and fifteen: a godly lifestyle. Uh, in in essence, what Amos is doing here is well, not so much Amos because remember now this is God speaking through Amos to the people. So in essence, this first outline, God is, is saying to the people of Israel, the northern 10 tribes, okay, and I want to emphasize this, and to us today, in other words, and to the church today, and to the Christian today. He's saying that if you want to live a godly lifestyle, this is, this is, the, this is the formula. I hate to use that word, but you get my point. Uh, this is the process, okay? So therefore, he says, uh, he says, Verse 14, seek good and not evil. Again, that 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 part of the verse is literally is, is literally saying, okay, seek not evil. In, in other words, if 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 you if you if you're not seeking good, I mean uh, evil, obviously you must be seeking good. So 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 in essence, um Ethel uh, Amos takes up this uh takes up his warning now by uh, by starting off by giving by giving this particular warning uh, by saying to the people uh, uh, seek not evil. Again, we understand now that that evil here uh, has to do with their current practices uh, of idolatry. Uh, not to mention the other things that they were doing, in particular the rich and what have you. Uh, so therefore, that was the uh, that's what was in mind here. So uh, the command to seek and love good is is practically the same as that to seek the Lord in Amos chapter 5 verse 4 and Amos chapter 5 verse 6 in, in other words uh, if you go there real quickly and we just want to look at those real briefly uh, go to Amos chapter 5 verse 4 uh, someone read verse 4 and then I want somebody to read verse 6 verse 4 
Go ahead, Sister Brain. Thus, uh, thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Go ahead, six. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire, uh, the house of Joseph, and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel. Okay, so you can see now, there, there again, now he mentions Bethel. Okay, remember I told you before, Bethel was where the, and not only Bethel, by the way, but that was another temple, another shrine he had built in Dan as well. But uh, his point here is, what are you talking about, Bethel? What are you talking about, Dan? Uh, the, the point here is what? Is that if you seek good, you will in essence live, meaning that what? Meaning that if you seek good, if you seek good because good, good is synonymous with seeking God. In other words, uh, God is good. So therefore, if you seek him, you will be able to enjoy the goodness. Uh, you, will, you will be able to enjoy his goodness. Okay. On the other hand, if you don't seek God and his goodness and instead you seek evil. And notice, uh, Sister Brain, read that last part of verse 7 again. You who turn justice, to, verse seven? Yes. Okay. You who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. Okay. Now, I want you to read that whole verse out of your NIV. Okay. To remnants of Jacob, this is five, seven. Hmm. Yeah, five, seven. To remnants of Jacob, Jacob will be in the midst of many people like dew from the Lord. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. I get ready to say, what, what book are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One second. Five, seven reads. I'm sorry, not five, seven, but five, six. My fault. Thank you. Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the house of Je Joseph like a fire. It will devour. And Bethel will have no one to quench it. So you can see now what he's doing now, right? He's comparing. Okay, Bethel, remember, is what? That's the false worship. That's the worship of the false gods. So now he's saying that that he's, and notice now how he, uh, read verse four again. Out of my NIV? Yes. Okay. This is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Okay, so now notice now in verse four, he calls it the house of Israel. Right. In verse seven, he calls it. The, I'm sorry, not seven. I don't know why I keep saying seven. But in verse six, he calls it the what? The house of Joseph. Okay. Remember what I said at the beginning of the of the lesson that that whether you whether whether the, the, the Bible uses the term the house of Joseph or whether it uses the house of Israel is talking about the same place. Remember what I told you before is that is that Ephraim. Is also another name that's used for the northern ten tribes. Okay, so whenever you read the term Ephraim, you know you're talking about the northern ten tribes. But also when you read the house of Joseph, you're also talking about the northern ten tribes. And when you read the house of Israel, you are also talking about the northern ten tribes as well. Remember we said before that Jacob, okay, gave two portions of the land to, to Manasseh. And he gave one portion to Ephraim. And these were the two sons of Joseph. And that's why he refers to it in verse six now as the house of as the house of Joseph. So on the one hand, he's saying that if you seek if if you seek good, you will live. If you don't seek good, then of course the Lord is going to unleash Himself upon you. And then he says that 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 the house of Bethel or Bethel will not be able to quench the fire once. In other words, we're talking now uh, about the wrath of God as well. So you can see now how he's how how on the one hand he's saying to seek God and you will live. If you don't seek God, uh, God will in God will in essence uh, unleash His wrath upon you. And no matter how many how many false gods you're worshiping, uh, they will not be able uh, to contain uh, God once He uh, once He does that. And and uh, the other part that I want you to see here is is that uh, uh, not only did they they not only not only did evil. Again, not only did the people do evil, but they sought it diligently. You see that one? And of course, uh, and what that means, of course, is, is that they were diligent in doing it. In other words, uh, they exerted all their strength in order to 
uh, in order to find and also do evil uh, as it relates to uh, how they live. So again, seek good and not evil. Again, uh, the idea about uh, seeking here, uh, again, like I said before, it, uh, it is the is the idea about about seeking something uh, in a diligent way. Uh, one of the places where you find this at, and I, I'd like for you to find this particular verse, where this word is used, uh, the same word that's that's used here for seek. This Hebrew word is also used in, in Leviticus chapter ten, uh, verse sixteen. So someone find Leviticus chapter ten, verse sixteen, and then someone find Deuteronomy chapter four, verses twenty nine. So you can see uh, the force behind. Uh, what God is saying. In other words, remember now, God is looking at the, the heart. Uh, he's not looking on, on the outward of, of how these people's how these people are acting uh, in an outward sense, but he's looking at the heart. And 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 what he says is, is that when I look at your heart, uh as as far as how you uh how you uh uh seek evil, it is done in a in a in a in a, in a diligent way, uh in, in a way where uh you exert all of your force, all of your strength in order to find uh, evil. So who has Leviticus 10, 16? Okay, I do. Read it. Uh, and while 10, she, uh, hold, hold on. While, while Sister Stella is reading that, someone find Deuteronomy 4, 29, so we can keep moving. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, King James, mm -hmm. uh, 10, 16, 10, 16 says, really? And Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering and behold it was burnt and he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar the sons of Aaron which were left alive saying so you see that word diligent there see how Moses diligently sought the goat the sought saying it. I'm sorry no diligently sought is correct and the point even Amos is making is that their actions weren't casual exactly right exactly right intentional intentional, purposeful, and they labored at it. Exactly right. Exactly mm -hmm. right. Now, Deuteronomy 429, and we're going to get the same idea. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. So you can see again the idea about this word is uh, this Hebrew word that's been used here. It's designed to do what, as Ryan was emphasizing before, uh, it's, it's designed to point out uh, their focus as far as uh, how far they was willing. In other words, uh, how far are you willing to go in order to seek evil, uh, in order to seek that which is evil? Uh, that's the idea uh, that the Lord here is emphasizing to the people. He's saying, in essence, uh, don't use that kind of strength. Don't use that kind of focus to seek evil, but do what? But seek good, because if you use, uh, and again, the Deuteronomy passage bring this out, if you seek God with that kind of, uh, with, with that kind of fervor, then most certainly you're going to what? You're going to most certainly find him. Mm. On the other hand, if you seek evil with that kind of fervency, guess what? Not only will you find it, but get this now, it's going to probably swallow you up and take you to a place where you really don't want to go. And if you're seeking, if you're diligently seeking God, that means you have to set aside time for that and your energy, and if you're doing that, you don't have time for the reverse. Exactly right. So Jesus says, to Ryan's point, Jesus says what? In Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God and mammon. You either got to serve one or you got to serve the other. You can't, you, you can't, <laughs> you, you don't have that kind of ability, okay, to serve both good and evil, Okay. And, and and of course now, here's a here was a killer, right? Here was a kicker right here. You and, and this I found very interesting. This, by the way, I believe this came from uh David Guzek, I think. Guzek. And, and, and I and maybe I've I can I've I was reading so many different people I forgot. But in any case, uh what this what this commentator make he what he points out is uh you cannot seek good. Now follow this now. You cannot seek good without first putting away evil. Mm -hmm. Hey, John. Yes. And just as an aside, another place that we studied about recently, another place that Hebrew word darash 
uh, was used. Lust. Second Samuel eleven three, and David sent and inquired. Yeah. Darash right. after the woman. Yeah. And and of course the other word is the other word that's that that Hebrew word is uh, translate to in the English of course is lust. Mm -hmm. right. Emphasizing the you know the intensity by which you uh, desire and strive to achieve. Again, remember now uh, it could be either good or bad. That's why Amos says seek. He uses the word seek not just from for evil, but he also uh, uses to seek uh, for the for the term uh, to seek uh, good as well. So you can see now how how you know how intentional now uh, uh, Amos is as far as he relates. As far as how it relates to uh, his uh, his uh, uh, admonition to the people, so in essence, what he's saying is what it seek. He, he's saying in essence what seek it holy again, and and this and this I think is key. Seek it holy. W h o l l y exclusively. In other words, not seeking it once a uh, one one while good. And then another time evil, but holy good, W-H-O-L-L-Y, good. And him who is good, he seeketh good who believes in him who says, again, I am the good shepherd. In other words, why do we seek uh, the Lord Jesus Christ? Why do we seek God with all of our heart, soul, and mind? Because again, Jesus has what? He has promised us, he has guaranteed us that he is what? That he is the good shepherd. He always has our well-being uh, in his uh uh, in his in his heart and in his uh, in his and in his soul, John ten eleven. And then of course he says, uh, "Seek that ye may live." Again, live. Of course, the idea is uh, in Him. Again, in God, uh, who is the life, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you by His holy presence, by His grace, and by His protection, as He has promised you. In other words. Uh, if you want the protection, if you want the grace, uh, if, if you want uh, to have the presence of God with us, then Amos, again, and, and that's why I, I started the conversation out by saying that this is the, uh, again, I'm, I'm using the term, but I'm using it loosely. This is a formula, okay, or a process by which uh, if we want to experience the presence of God, uh, the grace of God and the protection of God, uh, we must what? We must what? We must first seek the Lord with all of our, our heart and soul. Uh, and he will most certainly uh, make those things known to us again. And, and again, let's let, let's bear in mind now, it does not mean that the presence of God will ever be taken from us, unlike in the old, in like in, unlike in the Old Testament. It, you know, God's presence will always be with us. The Lord Jesus Christ has promised us that, that he will be with us always, Matthew 28. Even until the end of the age, even until the end of the world, I will be with you. Okay. But the but the but 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 the idea of uh, of that that realization uh, and the benefits of His presence with us uh, is what's in view here. And of course, uh, protection. God will protect uh, His people, even as you uh, even as you may uh, even as you may know, uh, even during those times when we're not acting our uh, acting our best, uh, God's protection is still over us, and we are so grateful. Uh, we are so grateful. And of course, that again is what? That is another sign of his grace uh, being manifested in his people. And of course, we already know now that Israel looked away from the sins whereby he displeased God and looked to his half worship. And, and I, I think we need to look at that word, uh, half worship of God, as entitling him to all which God had promised to full obedience. Uh, again, now I, 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 that that word is intentional. Uh, as our late pastor would use that word, uh, the the intentional word that I, I'm using is is half worship. In other words, we give God half worship, and then we do that, and then we think that we are still entitled to everything that God has promised us. And this is why I say this is this is a uh, this is a message for today. <laughs> I mean, but this is I mean this lesson is really. Uh, I mean, it's it's really, uh, I mean, it could be Amos up in the pulpit, I as well say. Uh, what talk, verse are we on? Still on verse 14. We, we used about half worship. Where, where did you get that from? No, that, that's just a phrase that I'm using. Because, uh -huh. 
In other words, that explained what the people were doing. In other words, they were trying to worship God in a half-hearted way, mm -hmm. okay, while worshiping idols. And then believing now that 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 after all, I am going to church. I am uh, I am you know doing this and that for the Lord. But yet and still, I want to I, I want to still worship at worship at the the altar of, Beth of Bethel. Sort of like I want to have my cake and eat it too. I want to sin here and there, and then I want to come to church on Sunday and do what I got to do. That's half worship. If if worship at all, I'm, I'm I'm just I'm just being nice by saying half because in essence it's not worship at all. And then we expect to receive all the entitlements of a child of God, which He's already promised to give us. Okay, but again, remember that God requires what full obedience to His command. So in in essence, uh, they were they were doing the outward part, but within their hearts. Uh, their hearts were far, 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 far away from God. As a matter of fact, it reminds us of John chapter eight, verse thirty-nine, uh, where 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 the where the uh, where the people of uh, where the uh, Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, uh, were warned uh, that just because uh, they were the sons of Israel or Abraham, it did not give them special privileges. In other words, they were calling themselves the sons of Abraham. And of course, Jesus reminded them that you that your father is not Abraham. Instead, your father is the devil. Again, that's John 8, 39. Uh, so therefore, uh, their thought was that uh, their, th this is their thinking now, okay? That I can, that I can do this sort of uh, lukewarm kind of worship. And whenever I get in trouble, God is going to what? He's going to deliver me. He's going to deliver us. Okay. Again, for your reference, Michael, we don't have time to read all these, but Micah chapter 3, verse 11. Uh, again, Micah chapter 3, verse 11, and then Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 10. And uh, what was that last one? I'm sorry. Uh, Jeremiah 7, chapter 3. I'm sorry, chapter seven of Jeremiah, verse 10. Okay. So in so in essence, they 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 uh they did what? Uh they wished or they wanted uh God to abide with them that they might be cared for. But they cared, but they cared again, but they cared not to abide with God. In other words, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, abide with me, Lord, but but I don't have to abide with it. In other words, it's we, we must always understand and emphasize that that it is a relationship that involves not one single person that's doing <laughs> everything and you and you enjoying the benefits. It's not a one-sided relationship. No, it's not. No, it's <laughs> not. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's move to verse 15. We're in verse 15, unless you got any other comments from verse 14. Verse 14, seek good and not evil that ye may live. And Well, no, there's another part to verse 14 I want you to look at. The last part where it says, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Now, now uh, I don't, uh, this particular title, uh, the God, I'm sorry, the Lord, notice how it's spelled, L-O-R-D, capitalized, and then the God of host. So, so that title alone, which is used at least three times in this particular uh in this particular passage, uh in, in the lesson that we're now uh looking at, uh, but this is a very unique uh 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 title uh that's given uh to God. And uh you can see already now that the the uh the first this first term we already we already have studied that term. Uh, Lord, we, we know that that's Jehovah, and of course, it's talking about the relationship uh, between him and his people, and this, uh, and of course, uh, his people in this case, of course, is the nation of Israel, and of course, it carries with it the idea uh, that it is he now who had delivered them uh, from Egypt, it is he now that has given them the land, it is he that has uh, gave them victory over all of their enemies, He it is he that who is what, who is the I am, the self-existent God. The God by nature and of nature, the creator and ruler 
and Lord of all, visible or invisible. And of course, again, that's designed to uh, to to draw a con a, a strong contrast now uh, against their false gods. And of course, uh, when he says now uh, he is the God of hosts, uh, normally now we would think that he's talking now about the heavenly beings, uh, the angelic hosts, and what have you. But in this particular case, it's not uh, is is not the Lord of the hosts, but it is it is uh, the God of hosts. And notice now that he in that this is of course. Uh, the term host there is a uh, is plural. So from that particular point, uh, you get the idea now that he's God of all things. And by saying host now, he's emphasizing that that all things in heaven and earth, the heavenly bodies from whose influence the idolaters hope for good, and the unseen evil thing who seduced them. And of course, he adds the title, uh, which people most shrink from, and that of course uh, is the title Lord. Because that, that is he who so threatened was the same who had absolute power over his creatures. Uh, again, remember the term Lord also uh, uh, is the term that also emphasized God's uh, sovereign rule over all things, over all creation. So again, that would also uh, highlight, and of course, it should bring attention now uh, to those who were, to those uh, who uh, Amos is talking to at this particular uh, point in time. So therefore, uh, here is the kicker again, that if you notice now that it really don't cost you nothing to own God as a creator. Okay. In other words, anybody, even unbelievers recognize God as a, as a creator. Uh, most unbelievers and uh, hopefully all believers, I, I would say all believers uh, believe that whatever causes, whatever happens, uh, the, the cause is always God. Uh, and of course, uh, we all believe that God uh, is the orderer of all things by certain fixed laws. Uh, so therefore, uh, all those things, if you got any kind of intelligence, uh, you would at least believe the, 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 at least two out of three of those things that I just said. But the question, but the question now becomes what? Is what man, okay, uh, or, or let's say it another way, what sinner, would shrink from those things to know that God is the creator of the world. Uh, and of course, uh, the cause of causes and those kind of things. Uh, what sinner, what man uh, would actually shrink from those things? But when you talk about God as Lord, God is sovereign, who is the absolute disposal and master of his sinful self. That's when you stand up and take attention. In other words, that's when you begin to uh, to, uh, to to listen, I should say, in regards to what is being said. And then, of course, you notice that in that last part of, of uh, uh, the God of hosts shall be with you as ye have spoken. So you can see now uh, that that by by setting forth that particular title, uh, it emphasized. Uh, again, now uh, it's emphasizing uh, to those who seek good that this will be your outcome is that the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. So you can see now that he's uh, that he's emphasizing that particular point in time. But on the other hand, he's also saying that if you if that if you seek evil, uh, God will the God of the Lord, the God of hosts uh, will also uh, be with you in a negative way. So you can see now how. Uh, how the title applies to both situations uh, in, as it relates to uh, this, uh, the, the manner by which uh, those who are seeking God. Any questions? Okay, let's move to verse 15. Hate the evil and love the good. Notice he said, uh, uh, and we already said this before, that man will, that man will not cease holy, H-O-W-H-O-L-L-Y, uh, to seek evil unless he hates. And of course, that word hate uh, uh, tends to speak about an intense dislike. And in your Sunday school book on page 160, on the right-hand side, uh, the, the right-hand column uh, in paragraph three, uh, the book points this out as well. And of course, as we said earlier, 
uh, nor will he seek good. Uh, now get this now, unless he love, which of course love has the idea about uh, having a tender affection for something or someone. Love must be guided by a keen sense of right and wrong. Again, that's on page 160 of your, of your Sunday school book, uh, right-hand column, paragraph three. And of course, you can understand uh, why that is why that is a sort of a principle. Uh, in other words, uh, love must be guided by a keen sense of right and wrong. What does that mean, by the way? Why do you well, why why do you think that 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 would be a, a truism? Love must be guided by a keen sense of right and wrong. Well, when I think of it, I'm thinking um, knowing the difference between right and wrong, uh, then you know what not to do. If I really love you, there's some things I cannot do because I know it's wrong. So I have a keen sense of what's right and wrong. And I, I what do you say? When I say I, I'm just talking about people, I ain't talking about I, I, but people, um, no, and they, 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 as we talk to run to what's right rather than trying to go anywhere near what's wrong. I know it's wrong. I'm not going to do it if I love you. Right. As a matter of fact, to that point, uh, Jerome, uh, who uh, translated the the Bible into Latin, uh, he says this about that term, and this is pretty much. Uh, undergird what Sister Stella just said. He says, uh, he hateth evil who not only is not overcome by pleasure, but hates its deeds. And he loveth good. Now, this is a part that I found interesting and I thought very, very pointed. Who not unwillingly or of necessity or from fear doth what is good, but because it is good. Again, going back to understanding, uh, having a keen sense of right or wrong, uh, is it right to do this? If and, and of course, if you if you love a person, if you and and, and we're talking now uh, about if you love God, okay, that should not be that should not be that idea that I'm going to do it because God said so. But I'm going to do it because I know that that that's what that that's a good thing to do. Because I serve a God who is good, and therefore, uh, because He only does good for me, I'm only going to do good towards Him. But 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 we must what we must have that keen sense of good. I'm sorry, that keen sense of what is right and what is wrong. It is always what it is always right to do good. Uh -huh. It is always wrong to do evil. And and to put it in. Today's scenario, places like a safe place are full of women who with a man who loved them. <laughs> and love is not possessive. Mm -hmm. Love right. is not destructive. Right. So yes, you have to have a keen sense of right and wrong to truly love. Exactly right. And 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 you can see all the implica the implication of this. Uh, you know, I, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there are those who say, you know, let's do this or that. And, uh, you know, and we can do it because, you know, I love you. You love me. But again, uh, is there sin involved? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Again, what's, uh, by, by having a keen sense of right and wrong, this will dictate how you act uh, towards each other. Uh, but mainly now, and, and get this now, mainly that has to start with our relationship between us and God. Of course. Because it is You cannot only have a keen sense without God in it. It's impossible. Because it the 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 foundation is is God, the right. love. Right. So the foundation be there. And and to Ron's point, there are some people that really don't know, they don't have that keen sense of what's wrong. He thinks he loves you. Mm -hmm. He thinks this is his way of showing love. He does not have that what you call a keen sense of right and wrong. Right. Because God's not in it. Exactly. Yeah, I hit you because I love you. It's the it's the it's the world sense of <laughs> right and wrong. It's 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 what some of us may have been taught indirectly. The the world sense of right and wrong, 
How do you know you're wrong in God's eyesight if you were never taught wrong? Or we may have never taught right. We may have observed it and thought that's the way it's supposed to be. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You we thought that way was right until we were taught what right is. Yeah. And and so now therefore you see your challenge. What what I mean, what I what I mean by you now, what I mean is that now as teachers. OK, you see why we why we keep harping on this thing called doctrine. OK, mm-hmm. because as, as to, to, to Sister Willis point, well, you know, this is how I taught either by way of observation or, yeah. I, or, or they actually or I was actually taught this way by someone else. OK, yeah. so therefore, uh, our responsibility is to do what is to teach God's people those things which pleases God. Yeah. And right now. God is saying what? If you want to please me, all you got to do is these is just these two things. Seek me first. In other words, seek because notice now, in verse 14 is what? It's seek good and not evil, right? And then in verse 15 it says what? Hate the evil and love the good. Same thing, <laughs> but he said it in two different ways, but he's saying the exact same thing. Okay? In, in other words, you cannot detach now verse 15 from verse 14. Okay. Right. And in verse 15, even though he's saying the same thing, he takes it even further. And in essence says, if in fact you hate the evil and love the good, then you will treat people fairly in the court system. Right. And and that's and that's why it leads right into the next. Because again, and, and again, the point being what? The point being is that you now know what is good. And because you know what, and, and of course now, let, and let me just say this, let me just say this. This is the this is the critical part of the church, is that is that you you are, you are making disciples, right? And these disciples now, you send them out into the world. Some are lawyers, some are doctors, some are school teachers, some are are you know just plain old mothers and fathers. Uh, some are your, some are, are just neighbors. Some are just, in other words. This is how we what? This is how we spread the image of God. In other words, uh, if 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 we are taught wrong, <laughs> and, and I want to just use an example, and and we are a lawyer, okay, we understand that we are to do only those things which are good. If you are a judge, okay, I am a you, you are you 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 are you are what? You are a Christian first. And therefore, you are to do what? We are to manifest the Christian values. Or as Minister Holmes was, was teaching on, was preaching on Sunday, uh, we are to live out the, the biblical worldview of who we are. And, and therefore, you see in verse 15, that is what that is what the, the that's what Amos is, is now uh telling the people, as Ron said, is that he, he said, now and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. So again, now the gate will be that place uh, where they would have uh, these little uh, enclaves or whatever you want to call them, uh, maybe little uh, little uh, rooms, if you will, uh, where uh, cases will be brought before the before the elders and the leaders of the community, and uh, or, or I should say, of the of the village in this case, uh, and they would resolve these various issues. Uh, so now Amos is saying, what hate that which is evil. Just because a person is poor doesn't mean that the person is automatically guilty, that he doesn't get a, a fair shake, so to speak, just as the, the same kind of fair shake uh, that you would give a man who is uh, who is much richer than this than this poor guy who is coming before you. Establish the, the word literally means uh, to set up firmly judgments. In other words, to, to, to set to set the, the, the law up firmly so that everyone is going to be treated fairly and rightly. So therefore, you can see now uh, why uh, why this is uh, why this is necessary uh, that 
that you first started with verse 14, and then of course uh, he progressively builds up the verse 15. Uh, and then he 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 gets to the end of the verse 15, and he said, It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Now, uh, this is where we have to be careful. This is where we have to be careful. Amos, uh, well, again, I keep saying Amos, but you know what I'm, you, you know what I'm talking about. God is speaking through Amos to the people. Uh, here God is not saying now, okay, uh, where he says, and some of your Bibles may use the word perhaps, perhaps it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant. Notice what he says now, to the remnant of Joseph. All right, so he is not saying here that if the people were to turn around, he's going to be gracious to them and withhold his punishment. That's not what he's saying. Because you know yourself now, we just came out of uh, out of 2 Samuel and was reading it about David, who God most certainly was gracious to him, but the consequences he had to still face. So from this standpoint, what and 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 the reason why you know he's not saying that is because look at the last part of the verse where he says, uh, again, he uses this title. The Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto, look at what he says now, not to the not to the house of Israel. He didn't say that. But he said to, as a matter of fact, he did not he did not even say to the house of Joseph, like he said before. In the, in, the, in the verse that Sister Brain read earlier. But he said what? The remnant of Joseph. What do you, what do you think he's trying to tell us there? Is it, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying now, okay? I'm thinking that it's only going to be a few that's seeking right mm -hmm. to do good. Well, uh, yes, and it's only going to, and because of that, it's only going to be a few that and God is going to preserve. Let's go back to uh, verse six. Yeah, right. Read verse six, Sister Brain. Verse six reads, seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. It will devour. Okay. So give me uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And Bethel will have no one to quench it. Right. So give me remember what I said before. The house of Joseph is the is the whole nation. That's the that's the that's synonymous with the whole nation of Israel. So therefore, God is saying that only a remnant will be delivered. And okay. he's primarily talking about Northern Kingdom because Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph and the two largest tribes. Exactly right. Okay. okay. Before we run out of time, I just have one question. So we're not talking about the end time. Well, not yet, but we will be in a few minutes. Oh, this this section coming up is talking about the end time. No, 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 no. Uh, we are, yeah, the the uh, the part later, but not now. No, uh, uh, the the part that's coming up. Yeah, the part that's coming up, the day of the Lord. Yes. Oh, but, I thought that was talking about when they went into captivity. No. Okay. The, the part that we're reading now, the verses 14, 15, 16, 17. Uh huh. This is talking about this. This is literally a prelude to the Assyrian captivity of the Northern 10 tribes. Right. Is that, is that what you was asking? No, I'm not, I, you know, the next section sounds like, like mm -hmm. what's coming in our future. It, well, well, yeah, in other words, uh, verses uh, 18, okay, starting at verse 18, is talking about the future. Uh, okay. No, no, no. We need to be clear there. 15, 14 and 15 is talking about the present. The mm -hmm. present from the standpoint of Amos. Yes. 18 and 19 is talking about 18, 19, 20, and 21 
So okay. he's saying, if you stay on, on this road, what you on right now, if mm -hmm. you staying with evil, don't look for, don't look for the end days. Cause uh, that ain't for you. You're not going to enjoy the good, the end day. That ain't for you. So he's saying that you go, it's going to be, it's darkness for you. It's light for, for those others, but it's going to be darkness for you. I don't even know what you're looking for the end times for. So mm -hmm. he's talking about that end time that you're talking about, uh, uh, Willow. But he's also saying like, it's not for you. Mm. Not if you skew it, not if you're going with evil. Mm. Stay there where you at. You, you don't, you won't see the. No, yeah, your, 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 your future is dark. Because mm. remember now. Uh, if you read the history of the captivity of the Assyrians, I mean the uh, the Assyrians' captivity of the northern ten tribes, they totally devastated that land, and they hauled the people off, and they they strewn them throughout the entire Assyrian Empire, and then they imported foreigners into the land and caused them to intermarry. That's where we get the Samaritans from. They were not fully Jews. They were not fully Assyrians. They were a mixed breed. Mm. But but the reality is is that that was that was the that's verse uh, six that Sister Brain just read. That was a fire now coming through. That was that was that was a judgment of God. So now when you get down to and of course I I, I would I would encourage you, but because of time. Please read verses 17, uh, 16 and 17, because uh, that leads into verse 18, because notice how verse 18 taught, uh, start. Woe unto you. Now, remember now, he's talking, to, he's still talking to the nation of the northern uh, uh, 10 tribes. He's saying, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Now, now understand now. <clears throat> uh, put yourself in this position. You got this prophet, he's telling you, that the that the judgment of the Lord is on the horizon. In essence, that's that that is that is a day that the Lord will visit you. That's what the term literally means. The day of the Lord is 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 is, is one of the meanings, but it but it's it's not the absolute meaning because uh, there is only one day of the Lord that the Bible talks about, and of course that is the end of the world. Mm. Okay, but this is this is a kind of end of the uh this is a kind of of there the Lord. So so therefore, because it is that, Amos question, Amos poses a question now. Why do you now desire that day? In other words, why do you desire that time in history to come upon you at this moment? It, it, and, and in other words, in essence, we have what we have there is uh you have sort of a uh you you sort of have people that we would call scoffers. Okay, people who uh, as a matter of fact, uh, turn your Bibles to First Peter. Turn your Bibles to, uh, I'm sorry, not First Peter, but Second Peter. Three verses three to four. And someone find Isaiah chapter five, verse 19. Okay, this Isaiah was another prophet who prophesied to the northern kingdom. Second and, Peter and, three. Well, I, actually, just write that down and read that later because I want you to actually read Isaiah five nineteen, uh, since it's actually talking about the same time that Amos is talking, or or I should say the same people, not necessarily the same time, but the same people. But so read Isaiah chapter five verse nineteen. As a matter of fact, Sister Brain, I need to bother you one more time. Isaiah oh. out of NIV, uh, Isaiah chapter five verse nineteen. Okay. To those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so we may see it. Let it approach. Let the plan of the Holy One of Israel come so we may know it. <laughs> Cynics. <laughs> uh, again, so you can you get the idea here now. The people are saying, well, let him come. Okay. Because remember now, their <laughs> idea is, is, that, is, is that when he comes, he's going to destroy all of our enemies. That's the mindset. So now Amos comes on the scene and he says, wait a minute. Whoa. <laughs> Remember now, this word woe is a very strong word, especially not, in the Old Testament. Yes, go ahead. Not, not only that, I, I hate to do this, but a quick 
summation of 16 and 17 sets up 18. Right. Because we you ought to read it. Because that honoring the dead was a big deal in Israel. Yeah. So much so that they paid mourners, usually women. Right. To come and cry. Yeah. And what he's saying in 16 and 17 is when this time comes, yeah. there's going to be so many funerals and so much crying, the women aren't going to be able to handle it. They're going to bring the men in from the farm. Right, right. The husband, yeah. Exactly. That's, that's how much destruction and death there's going to be. Right. So based upon that, that's, that, that, that's, that's what raises the question. And again, notice the word now. Is is uh, under you that notice his word desire? You, you, in other words, you long for you. Uh, you, you have a, 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 a this, this this longing for this day to come upon you. To what end is it for you? In other words, Amos is Amos is is, is posing these these logical questions now. The woe unto you who desire this. Uh, this 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 uh, this kind of calamity to come upon you. And woe is only three letters. It's a small word, but it has it's a powerful. Meaning. It's uh, uh, it's it's only one woe here. But when you saw it, sometimes the Bible uh, extends this to uh, to three, which of course is is uh, more or less infinity. In other words, uh, woe woe woe. You read about, especially you read this in Revelation. But uh, sometimes uh, you read this also. Uh, in the Old Testament as well. And it just heightened uh, the idea about... Uh... Hi, that's my daughter, by the way. Come here. Say hello. Is this going to be bad for everybody? Say hello hey, hi, beautiful. Hey. This is my beautiful daughter here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Love, Love you. you. Okay. Love you too. Talk to Craig, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So okay. Well... I guess since she's there, we're going to be ending this soon, y'all. Uh, <laughs> Tell her all dismissed. She said, she said you all are dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let's look at it. Let's continue on. Okay, Second Peter 3, verses 3 to 4 also talks about this. Uh, Jude 118 uh, also speaks about it as well. Uh, and again, now, uh, I'm going to give you some more verses uh, because I, I want you to really uh, understand why Amos posed these questions, uh, because now we're talking about... Uh, Is this going to be bad for everybody? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. That's what I figured. Yes. 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 My God. Because remember now, we're talking about the... Literally, you're talking about the second coming of Christ. That's what you're right, talking right, about. Right, right, right. Uh, you're talking about the you know, the six, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bold judgments, where where the, this world will be will be literally devastated. Uh, during the first seal, uh, three quarters of the world will be just destroyed. Men, mankind. You know, all the all the grass, all the uh, all the grass, all the trees will be burnt up. This is the day of the Lord. This is this is not a time, and the, and this is Amos' point. <laughs> Why do you desire that? Because again, uh, they're thinking one thing, and they're not realizing the extent of the devastation that 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 will be upon the world during this period of time that's called the Day of the Lord. Remember now, so devastating will this time be that in Matthew twenty four, the Lord Jesus Christ said this. That if that time was was not shortened, there would not be any person that would ever survive. Again, this is this is this is God's judgment on the world. Okay, so so you can see now this is this is behind the question uh, where Amos says, uh, "To what end is it for you?" And then of course he began to say, "Now again, now he's talking about that specific." That specific period of time, and let me let me go to my board so you can see what I'm talking about here. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen. This is my whiteboard. Can you see my whiteboard? Yes. Okay, so we're talking now. 
about time. Okay, right now, this is Amos time here. And he's talking about, he's talking directly now to Israel. Uh, or, in other words, the ten northern tribes. Okay, God has already prepared the Assyrians to, in essence, uh, conquer them. And, of course, eventually uh, the Babylonians will, will conquer the, the uh, southern uh, ten, uh, the southern, the southern two tribes. And they will also devastate the land, but they will not only devastate the land, uh, they will they will they will utterly destroy the temple. They will take all of the, the treasury and everything back to uh Babylon. So that's this period of time. And I'm, and I'm just gonna put here this is pre pre church. Okay. We are here. Okay, this is called what the age of grace. This is a period of time now where God is what? He's he's building the church. Mm. Now when the last saint is saved, okay, when the last saint is saved, there's, there's going to be coming upon the world this period of time called the seven-year tribulation period. Mm. This is called the day of the Lord. Remember now, mm -hmm. although it says day, it's not talking about 24 hours. It's speaking about what? A, a specific period of time. So whenever you hear this term, you must come here. This is where your mind must come to. Because this is the final judgment. This is a period of time where Peter talks about this earth that we live on will be burned up. So that's why as Christians, now hear me now, that's why as Christians now, you should not become alarmed at what the world called global warming because I assure you that God is not going to allow man to destroy his world. So therefore, again, we're talking about all those things that Revelation talks about. The seal, the trumpets, and the bold judgments. And then, of course, ultimately speaking, we know that at the end of that period of time, uh, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign uh, will take place where Jesus, along with us, will reign for a thousand years. And then, of course, it's at the end of the thousand years where the world will be burnt up. In other words, it is the end of the world at this particular point in, in time. So that's what's Amos. And, and that's why Amos says what? This period of time is what? It's darkness. Okay? In other words, there, and of course, he's not talking about darkness from this, uh, simply from the standpoint, uh, you know, that the, the sun will not be able to shine, the moon is uh, will be turned to blood and what have you. But he's talking about, he's talking about the character, that which will characterize this time frame. It will be darkness. It will be a time what, which the world has never even seen before. And then, of course, in verse 20, uh, Amos says, you know, shall not the day of the Lord, again, be darkness and not light? And notice what he says now, even very dark and no brightness. In other words, there is no goodness that will be seen in this particular period of time. So this is what this is what he's referring to. So he's saying, why would you desire this day now? It would be like us now saying, you know, and, and of course now, uh, and, and I'm guilty of this as well. We long for the Lord to return, and we do. But just bear in mind now that when he comes, it won't be a little baby in a manger. It's going to be the king a conquering king or the conquering king. And he's going to be coming for his people. But most importantly of all, he's going to be coming to bring judgment, darkness upon the world. 
So I hope that you have an understanding about that particular period of time. And then, of course, notice now, as time goes away from us, look at verse 21. I, and, and again, this is why I, I'm saying that this that this lesson needs we need to take our time because uh, it's talking to us. He says, look, look what he says. Now, remember now, he's talking uh, to people who are, in essence, uh, they are deep in sin. Now, they are deep in idolatry. Okay, so he says, now, I hate, I despise your feast days. And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. So, so, so again, now he's talking to uh, people, uh, uh, ancient people, and their practices uh, in the nation of the northern ten tribes. But I want you to see what he's saying to us today. He's in essence, he's saying to the church today is what? Look, all this stuff you all are doing, all these special days and these other things that I, I, I hate them. <laughs> I'm I'm not coming to your bake sale. A exactly right. Yeah, all your special days. I'm I'm not I'm not participating in it because guess what? I'm not in it. And, and I mean, I mean, and, and think about this now. I want you to think about this. When we do these special days, I'm not just talking about shallow. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Mm. Who is the focus? Yes, <laughs> you say that God is the focus, but when you look around and when you look at what we're doing, <laughs> mm -hmm. God is saying, "Look, I." I hate, I despise, and of course, he used feast days here because that's that's how they would celebrate. They they had these various feast days. Mm. Well, but we have the same thing: Men's Day, Women's Day, anniversary. All these are, are special days, okay? Where 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 God is saying that, you know, I hate these things. That's what he said. Because, because why? Because they're putting, you're putting them in front of me so much so that the people, not even you can see me. But, but, but minister, um, um, Kyle, for the life of me, I can't understand. If we know this, why are we doing this? Well, I didn't say we know this. We, that's why no, we, we know this. Oh, we do. Oh. Yeah, we know this. We've known this. <laughs> for years. And if we teach this on Sunday, somebody's going to ask the same question as well. Okay. If we can know, I ask this, I'll this every time we talk that. about this, we talk about this in this in the teachers meeting. We talk about how it's not of God. This is not what He called us to do. And and, and guess what? All we can do is teach it. Okay. Mm. Because be, because again, going back to what you had uh, said earlier. Uh, there are certain things that we were taught and we were taught wrong. And unfortunately, it has gone down through generations. And and, and it, it has become uh, so, so uh, embedded in us until it's become, until it's become part of us. Mm -hmm. I, I think we, we discussed one time a long time ago uh, about uh, uh, the Sabbath day. When back in the old country, you know, you wouldn't do, uh, when Sunday came, you wouldn't do nothing. Right. Because we were taught that way, but but then we were we were able to teach uh, our students now that the Sabbath day is not the same <laughs> as it was in the old. It's it's for the Jews. So so again, uh, as we teach people, then these things will become. But see, we we did make one change, John. Yes, sir. I don't remember his name, but I remember years ago when we had a guest teacher here and he said he did not refer to himself as reverend because he said nobody should be revered but the oh, Dr. Lord. Dr. Burwell. Okay, Dr. Burwell. That stuck with me and from that point forward, the ministerial staff started referring to- Whoa, hold on, what happened? Instances when oh. we know better, we do better, but not all. Okay, Ryan, you need to repeat that because you froze. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you froze. We heard him. Oh, you <laughs> heard him? Oh, okay, I guess. We, we no, I, I simply okay. said that was one instance <laughs> where we knew better and did better. Right, right. So we, we can carry that beyond just that. So 
There are some times when we're awake and we're taught better and we say, hmm, got to change this. Got to change that. OK, so so again, uh, we will keep on teaching. OK, uh, because that's the only authority that we have. Uh, in other words, we will be like Amos. We will call a spade. In other words, we will teach the pure word of God. And as Ron just pointed out, the people themselves will begin to change because now they will understand that, okay, what well, this is, I, 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 and, and, I, and I think that when you read verse 21, 22, and 23, we don't have time now because time is gone, but you, you can see how God feels about these things that we're doing. And, and, and how strongly he can, notice what he says, uh, though, ye, though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, Look what he says. I will not accept them. Notice this now. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. And then look at 23. Take thou away from me. You, you see that? Take thou away from me the noise <laughs> of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vowels. In other words, another kind of uh, musical instrument. Then, of course, he goes on and talks about uh, instead of this, uh, again, let judgment run down the the, the the Hebrew word for the word run uh, down is literally a uh, rolling down. And and by the same token, I'm sorry, uh, if you cheat me, talking about me behind my back, lying on me, don't invite me to your house for dinner. Right, exactly. <laughs> mm, devour one another. Yeah. You devour. <sighs> okay, my brothers, my sisters. He's saying you 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 you're doing burnt offerings to me, and you're oppressing my people. You're cheating my people. You're robbing my people. Oppressing them. Oppressing them. Involved in idolatry, and you want to bring me a meat offering? Yeah. Huh. Uh. Look inside there. Sorry. No, you're okay. Uh, but yeah, that's and and that's the and that's this and, and that's why you know I said at the beginning that this lesson is is rough. I didn't say rough, but uh, most certainly that's what I meant. Is no, the, I uh, got it when I read it. I said, "Whoa!" Yeah, it's rough because it's current. Right, and, and that's what I said before is that yeah. out of all the lessons that we've done so far, this particular one. Is more uh, uh, of of a to, up to date kind of thing. That in other words, this is us. All I can say is we all better be prepared for a bunch of questions. Bunch of questions. Mm. I know. I know. I and know. for the young people, for the young people, I would I would just strongly emphasize. The, the seeking part, mm. especially, in other words, mm. seek the good mm. and hate the evil mm -hmm. and love the good mm -hmm. and treat each other in a, in a, in a, in, in a way that will manifest God. And I, I think along with that, John, we could probably ask them how they spend their time routinely. Good point. And then what things do they spend time on that are not profitable or perhaps even harmful? Yeah. Then ask the question, what if you took that time since it's not benefiting you and devoted that to the Lord and what is good. Mm. Exactly. Because what? Because that is good to seek and, right. and, and meditate. And, 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 and again, uh, we know that that's, you know, to young people, that's kind of foreign. But we, we need to do what? We need to remind them that this is who you, this is who you have now declared yourself to be. I like how uh, 171, the age group emphasis. Yes. It's real yes. simple for the children. Say it. We don't we don't have to complicate it. it. Said children, the overall theme of people trying to fool God will resonate with the children. 
have them explore the idea of how people try to fool God and how it never works. It's real simple. Don't pretend when right. it comes to God. Take God serious. Yeah. And that's a good point, Willa, because with the same token, depending on the age of the children, you can ask them how successful they are at fooling their parents. <laughs> because I know I told my kids, anything you think about trying to do that's wrong, yeah. I already did it and I did it better. <laughs> and I got caught, by the way. Yeah. We can tell the adults, don't play with God. Don't yeah, that was from last week's lesson as well. Yeah. All these lessons are, for the most part, saying that, uh, mm. emphasizing what Sister Willa just said. Mm. Remember remember the Lord's word to the church of Laodicea. Mm. You know, I wish it were either hot or cold. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. In other words, I, 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 you know, be on one side or the other. Don't, you know, don't, hmm. don't try to be in the middle. Hmm. Hey, John. Yeah. Yes. Finally, I, I saw this, this quote from uh, uh, one of your, one of your guys uh, from uh, Dr. Constable. Hmm. He said, Today, people will pay high prices for tickets to, quote, Christian concerts, yet they won't attend a free Bible study class or Bible conference in their own church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christian music is big business today, but we wonder how much of it really glorifies the Lord. What we think is music may be nothing but noise to the Lord. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, that and, will... and that's 23. That's verse 23. Yeah, exactly. That's very Take that away from me the noise of that sound. Yeah. Yeah, God is God is like very, you know, up front, up in your face now. Okay, uh again, thank you all for coming for for, uh, for committing uh